This is for the nerds. This is for the brainiacs. This is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back. You ain't gonna touch me. You're not gonna do nothing. You are not above me. I bet you wish you was me. I know it. I know. This just in. Licking toads can make you good at No Limit Texas Hold'em. Who knew? Live at six, we have the toxicology report that is somehow allowing Bryn Kenny to crush the high rollers. This is right up your alley, Melissa. What is? You know, getting a shaman, winning all the money. I the, wish. The I would have won way more by now if I had a shaman. Where, where, where's, where's your guy to tell us that uh michael or matthew yeah where's where's matthew to tell us what star sign i should be operating under while getting frog poison injected into my veins bring him in and we'll we'll see bro the <laughs> eye one was crazy like the eye where like oh we're gonna pour acid in well, your that's eye. the thing like you can put lsd in your eyeball relax i'm trying to live i'm trying to live <laughs> god damn yeah how dare you get this frog toxicology going on we're gonna put acid in your eyes do you trip harder if you put acid in your <laughs> eyeball I, instead of on your tongue um i think it no i don't think so but my friend used to do it when i was in high school it's Why definitely a choose thing the eyeball do. over he had it in an, eye, in an eye dropper <laughs> uh, i it might it might hit you differently i don't know maybe. i haven't tried it so what what are we referring to, Bert? All right, enough <laughs> enough with the the bullshit. Let's let's talk about Wait, what there's, we just Wait, there's saw. more pressing stuff to talk Every, about. Everybody, I'm sure, uh, just watched the Doug Polk podcast with Martin Zumani. Um, I actually had heard all of this a little over a year ago. Zumani and I were in Park City for a private game that we were playing in. He got a little wine drunk and really spilled all the tea. So none of this was really new to me uh, when we were talking about, you know, people who were potentially cheating the other day and I threw Bryn Kenny's name around. Zumani was the source that it was coming from uh, as he was his horse for the better part of two years. Um, I, I struggle a little with where, the, like the direction that this is taking. Uh, we're to the point now where like we need to see some receipts. Mm. He, he made a lot of pretty wild accusations. Big claims. Big claims. Yeah, and right. he's not exactly the, the, like the most organized storyteller. Yeah. So it's, and it's all fine. I'm not trying to refute him. I think, I, for the most part, uh, my opinion is that I think that he's telling the truth. Mm -hmm. But he implicated Dipthrong yeah. as being a perennial ghoster, which... You know, for those of us who have been around for two decades, this is nothing new. Uh, he implicated Volpe, saying that they're basically sharing whole cards in a mixed game that they're running. I think that like that's something that you know he should be able to demonstrate pretty easily, if true. Um, he implicated Bryn to many, many, many levels, which we're going to cover, right? Uh, as well as a handful of his horses, people that I'm less familiar with, Euro Regs, I'm guessing. Also, um, I, I forgot one of, like a long time rag, he's, he's, he's Indian, I forget his name. Oh, uh, Shankar. Shankar. Uh, but some facet, I don't know. He just mentioned him very briefly, but I didn't really understand the context. Yeah, uh, I wasn't either. listening that closely. But it sounded like at minimum, he might have been a part of the stable, I'm not sure. Um, but the, the, bigger, the bigger conversation, the bigger topic of conversation here is that there is this effective cheating pyramid with Bryn at the head. And if what Martin is saying is true, runs pretty fucking deep into the streets of GG. Now I can speak on my own personal experience to corroborate a little bit of what Martin was saying. Back in 18, 2018, I believe, when Gigi was first getting off the ground, uh, Bryn was the face. He was the ambassador. He was the biggest part of anything. He was the first one we ever saw wear Gigi. Right. I remember, because it was, it was a super high roller or, or one of those, like he wore Gigi, no one, everyone was like, what is that? And then yeah. we later find out. <clears throat> um, but at the time, uh, the high roller circuit was just kind of getting underway and uh, I was still kind of a part of it. So we were one year removed from playing the super high roller bowl. Uh, I played the occasional 25k at Aria, whatever. And he would DM me pretty relentlessly on Facebook saying like, you know, these 5k's are popping off every single day. Like they're super soft. 
Uh, I bring in a ton of whales, yada, yada. Just let me know. I'll get you set up. And this was when apps were first being developed, like Poker mm. Master and Poker Fishes uh, were the two Chinese apps that were pretty widespread. GG initially was launched, at least by the way that I understood it, as effectively being a Chinese app. So uh, it was effectively you were getting the Chinese player pool on uh, a web-based mm -hmm. uh, downloadable um, interface or whatever. And Bryn was a massive part of it. As far as I understood, he was a partner. Uh, now, I don't know how true any of this is, but rumors were that Kerry was the money backing everything behind Bryn uh, throughout the, the rise of his success. So there seemed to be some business dealings there. That was pretty well known, I think. Like the yeah. that Bryn was backed by. Harry. Yeah, I mean, I'm just repeating. But we don't. We don't. Obviously, we, we, don't we can't know. confirm. We don't I'm just repeating what I've yeah. heard. Right. Um. And so, uh, you know, I don't know how much of his. I don't know how much he was involved in financing GG. Um. But you know, they do have a partnership still to this day. Uh. In any event, basically, the way that I was understanding it was that Bryn was their number one agent. He was out there signing people up, and it was the exact same marketing deal as the way these poker apps were set up he's the agent he creates a downline that downline keeps bringing in people uh the rate goes up the the chain and there's a dilution taking place throughout right so like if you're on the fifth layer of the totem pole you may have like 20 percent rake back to offer to certain vips right. and the upline above you is all getting a cut along the way um what do we think about that well, the model, model itself is is whatever, uh, but it's problematic because the rake is so high, right? And I think people forget a lot about like what GG's history has been. There was a, a, a you know, Doug went hard after Negrano with the whole more rake is better, um, and and rightfully so with the way that it was kind of framed. But uh, GG kind of took on the same platform, and it wasn't all that long ago. It might have been like 2019, maybe, uh, where they were running nosebleed PLO, right? And they were raking. Uh, really, really high at the highest stakes, basically saying that they didn't want pros in those games. Yeah. And what they would do is, uh, based off of your ability, they would offer like massive amounts of rake back. And that's how these apps operate too. If you're a pro and you get into an app game, you're probably not getting any rake back and you're going to struggle to beat the rake because you're losing like, you know, a buy-in every hundred hands or so uh, yeah. that, that you VPIP. Right. Um, but you know, the weaker players are getting a huge kickback because they're what keeps the game running. Right. And it seems like GG adopted that, uh, sort of rate structure. I'm not convinced it's bad. Um, I'm, not I'm just convinced it's bad for pros, yeah. which is what it is, right? Like that they don't owe pros anything. Like if they want to be a site that is literally catering to only amateurs, they have every right to do that. Okay. Um, Right, it's their business. But the bigger deal with this downline that Bryn seems to be creating or this agency is, at least according to Martin, uh, it comes with a lot of caveats that seem to offer a massive edge to him specifically and anybody that he has involved. So the way Martin explains it is that there are some key points to touch on. Number one, uh, he seems to have some level of proof that Bryn was able to see his screen yeah. Anytime the GG client was open. That part is scary. Right. Because the way that Martin described this was I wrote something to my friend that I told to just keep quiet. And I was trying to like set a trap for Bryn, which Bryn fell on. And then he asked me about pretty much the conversation I just had with my friend. And then that happened on two instances, at least. That's what Martin was saying. I only heard him refer to the one, but... Well, it was, it was one about the money at the Aria box. Mm -hmm. And then there was another one about a tournament that he busted, like some 5K. Okay. So at least that's what I remember. Obviously, I could be wrong. But those are the two things. But that's nuts. Yeah. Like, the fact that, like, someone could just see your screen, what if... Well, and there's, there's yeah. a... It, it's less speculative because, uh, to my understanding, that's how GG caught the people that they banned. Is it was... It was a kind of a two-pronged system number one they would just view your desktop remotely and then number two if uh they didn't find anything but they th still were suspecting of things they would test your play against their algorithm but the scary part about this is that if what martin is saying is true 
then Bryn has some sort of access to security. Right, right. So, so here's the thing. Let, let's, let's lay this out. As far as I understand, all sites have the capacity to do this. I'm pretty confident that I've had conversations um, where it's confirmed that Party Poker can do this as a security measure. I'm pretty confident that in legalized industries such as we're in, uh, sites like BetMGM, mm -hmm. WSOP, et cetera, they have the capacity to see your screen at all times. Uh, so I'm very confident that what Martin's saying is well within the, the security measures that an operator can take to ensure uh, a level gaming environment. Wow. The other wow. side of that is I'm pretty confident that Bryn and was, was an early adopter of GG and has massive, massive stake in the company to the point where he threatened them to leave and start his own offshoot because he had such a big downline. He had so much, uh, he, he made up, like his downline made up for such a large percentage of the revenue that Gigi was bringing in that wow. they ultimately worked something out in private and Bryn squashed that, that plan, right? So if those two things are true and it led to Bryn having some level of access at the secure level, which I don't know if this is still the case or not, um, but there was a point in time where I believe GG was operating with, like way in the early stages, that they were operating with uh, poker players at the skirt, or maybe I'm conflating them with poker kings. Didn't John Andreas and- poker kings. And Petrangelo, okay, so that was poker, poker kings. kings yeah. Sorry, I, I don't wanna get this confused. In any event, if they did give him the keys to the castle, so to speak, and he's running a stable on, the, on this site uh, and guaranteeing the, the, the prize pools, he's pretty heavily incentivized to you know, take a lot of liberties here. So it's, it's not really discrediting Martin in any way, shape, or form. That's not to say that Martin is 100% factual. Like I still think that we need to demonstrate some level of, yeah. of receipts here. But this is everything that I've been hearing for, for years. Like, I stayed away from GG purposefully uh, for a lot of these reasons. I knew a lot of friends who were on there that were saying, like, you know, I, I've never had any problems. But they also, like, weren't big winners. You know, small figures, 10, 20, 30,000, whatever. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like this is very, very sketch in a way that's so much more corporate than the other levels of cheating that we've been talking about with Ali and Jake. Yeah, this... They, they somehow were... found a way to one-up. No, what, what I'm saying, coming. what I'm saying though, is like, okay, that part is true, right? But let's put a bow in that for a second, because there were some real cheating allegations though, still, where Bryn allegedly was using Lauren Roberts' account. There so this, I, this I'm much more familiar with because I remember when it was happening in real time. Lauren was playing in our game at Aria a lot. And we, we all watched this unfold. We saw Bryn palling around with her. Uh, she would tell us how he would stay at her house and how close of friends they were and things of that nature. Um, Farah today kind of came out and, and corroborated it as well that she's known this for a long time. And like all of us kind of watched it unfold. We, we knew Lauren disappeared and we didn't know why. Like she, and this is Farrah Galfon for yeah, those yeah. people that don't yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, but Fer, or sorry, Lauren just like disappeared into the poker hospital and we weren't really understanding why. And it was a big part of this. Like between her and Joel, they lost millions on the GG site. And allegedly, Bryn was basically running these 5Ks around them and sending stables in there to basically clip them for whatever he could. Uh, and then on top of that, by wielding such a friendship with her, allegedly Martin said that uh, Lauren confirmed today via text that Bryn was also playing on her account sometimes. That's nuts. So now he's getting both sides of it, right? Both sides. Of, yeah, go ahead. So he's getting the rake. He's getting the EV value passed on to his horses when she plays or when Joel plays. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, he's now getting his unfair share whenever he gets to play on an anonymous account that's fish tagged by every so single three red. three sides of it. So right. somebody on Twitter, um, Ruzi, I think he's a streamer, but he looked up the shark scope graph for HE22 
and found that the biggest losses were all uh, between five and 10K buy-ins with small fields. These fields are like, uh, many of them are under 30 people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a straight line down 2 right. million. Down 2 mil. Um, other way. Sorry. There you go. So a thirty person field for right. two million losses. That's 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 a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of fucking really buy small bro. fields. A lot of buy-ins. Yeah. And I mean honestly, like that's that's not that hard to pop off, right? Like you're talking about a couple hundred buy-ins where you're probably averaging like three per. So maybe you're talking about a hundred tournaments over the course of a year, a half a year, something like that. Right? right? Like Lauren's very wealthy, so is Joel, and they love poker to death. I mean, I see Lauren grinding WSOP online all right, the time now. Right, right, right. We do see that. Uh, so it's like, you know, she's in there. She's playing 215s. She, she just enjoys it. She wants to get good. So when a trusted friend says, like, hey, I have soft spots for you where you can compete at stakes that you will enjoy, um, she's in. And, like, for a long time, she refused to play cash because she felt like she couldn't compete in – in games that were too like she felt like not that the 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 money factor was too big but like that the game would play big enough where uh she wasn't able to neutralize uh being being kind of like behind the curve versus some players right. like basically there were scary players in the game let's yeah. put it that way right uh so when Bryn kind of says like hey look uh, i have this environment that i created i literally handpicked everybody who's in the event i'm guaranteeing the the prize pool you're safe here and she just goes on a straight downtrend where, like, you know, there isn't even so much as a, a, a reasonable cash. It's just like, okay, yeah, like, you could be a losing player, but, like, there's a difference between being losing and, and like, just getting fleeced. That's rough, man. No effort and thought of that actually happened. Okay, the next thing was that he said, if I made a final table, like, I had to, like, snap be ghosted. Um, and then also, like, if I didn't do, we could get to the yoga and stuff later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, I think all that shit's ridiculous. Like, it's 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 jokes to talk about, and it probably speaks a lot to uh, Bryn's ego and his desire to be a fucking shaman or cult leader or whatever the fuck it is. But the more important stuff to keep the topic of conversation on on hand is that he has th there. There's one of his horses coming outward now, saying that I could not go deep into an event without being ghosted. And basically saying that not only was he being ghosted, but he was forced to live with his ghoster who was just snap RTAing anytime that he was in a big spot. Yeah, that's... Also a lot of like weird uh, manipulative like cult leader type behavior, if true, is really seedy and not... It's just not a good situation for anyone being staked to be pressured to, to go to a psychic and right. have toad stuff put in cuts in your arm and like it's just all very odd and it feels like something you'd watch in like but a it's netflix also documentary one of these things, like i do want to get back to this final table thing but i want to address your topic like it seems as if it's opportunistic because martin didn't want to do all this but he was like calling his mom telling him like i'm broke like i have no other options like my backer went to jail like what am I supposed to do yeah. now? Like I'm done. So I mean, people stay in situations like that without any financial things right. going on. Like that it's people get manipulated into those situations. It's like a form of control. Too. Yeah. It's just like so do we think that Martin now making these claims of like RTA at final table, all these things. And he's saying, I have these, I have these receipts. Like Bryn is a big enough name that for us to like take him down for something like this, he's going to need some more. All right, so yeah. here, here's my take. First and foremost, I don't want to let Martin off the hook. He's obviously complicit. Now, I, I definitely sympathize with his situation, and I think he made a very compelling case that, like... And I know Martin well. Like, he is... He's, he's he, the B team. <laughs> he, I, I upgraded him. He's the A team now. Uh, <laughs> he knows about it. It's an inside joke. I, I love this kid. Like, he's so genuine to a fault right yeah. so it's just like he's not gonna hide behind the fact that he's complicit in doing something wrong so me saying like you know you're not off the hook here you were agreeing to be ghosted you were agreeing to rta you were agreeing to these things stay in the backing deal yeah i don't think he's gonna skirt that responsibility and i can sympathize with the financial situation that he's in like money and power go hand in hand and when that gets leveraged against you you get into some fuck spots like yeah. We've been talking about this internally a little bit for like the last week or so. And I want to make it abundantly clear. This isn't a witch hunt 
to eliminate cheating from poker. We're not ridiculous people, right? Like We're not naive. <laughs> yeah, this is not a black and white world. We don't all live in some sort of realm where we believe there's a TO, TOS uh, or TOC above us that like if you infract upon a, a single line in a, a 300 line contract or whatever that you're just damned from the community and should be banished. I'm not that ridiculous. Obviously, everybody has some degree or some scope of missteps along the way in their career. What I'm talking about is scalable cheating. Yeah. Right? So when people talk about like, well, fuck Bonomo, he was the biggest multi-accounter around. It's like, okay, yeah, that happened. And he owned up to it. And it was in a time frame where we didn't really know much about much, right? So multi-accounting back then was similar to RTAing now. But the difference is, is that it was a lot more detectable and he got caught very fucking quickly he paid his he paid his crime and most importantly it wasn't scalable at least not he didn't scale it let's mm -hmm. put it that way right that's not to let bonimo off the hook but it's to say that like there's a big difference between a 21 year old kid and a 35 year old man who's been in the industry now for the better part of two decades right and now you could say like okay well a lot of the bad actors now are young so you should just chalk them up to being young and stupid. It's like, well, no, because a precedent was set by fucking Bonomo. Yeah. Right? Like, we had all this wave of cheating take place, and we snuffed it out, and we did a lot about it, right? We caught super users like uh, Hamilton with Absolute. We fucking caught the UB scandal. We, we had the Brian Hastings situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People forget about that, <laughs> but, like, you know, that was... Just as simple. I mean, there were a couple, right? There was the the one with Isildur, which by today's standard wouldn't even be considered cheating. It was just information right. sharing. Uh, and then there was the more recent one in 2018 where he was VPNing into, I believe it was Stars, playing big mix games and uh, playing under someone else's account. Obviously, that's super fucking unethical, um, but it's not scalable either. So I'm not giving him a pass. It's fucking terrible. But right. also, like, I don't want to lose the forest for the trees. Yeah. There's a big difference between some minor infractions and people running full-blown stables where they are RTAing, they're ghosting, they're potentially sharing pull cards amongst the team. Right. There's potential that somebody is a breach in security and can be super using the way I mean, Hamilton it's full was. full-on, like, organizations. Like, mm -hmm. they're, they are... Yeah. effectively it's a, criminal it's a, it's organizations it's a right. cheating yeah. syndicate yeah. Right. <laughs> right crime exists in the real world at every single level but we don't give a fuck about people who run traffic lights or petty theft or whatever it's like it's unfortunate i'd love to hold people to a higher moral standard yeah but you know they're not such egregious actors that it's going to collapse the it's world it's different than a full scalable operation that is pulling in millions and millions right. of dollars from right. the ecosystem we look at organized crime we look at crime syndicates right and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about cheating in this industry uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of people who are speaking out for the cheaters. I shouldn't say a lot, but there have been a handful of very loud voices speaking out for the cheaters. And every single one of them is surrounded by morally corrupt people. Yeah. Like, I haven't seen one single person come out of the woodwork and say, like, you guys are way out of line trying to reduce the amount of bad actors in this community and just be like a morally just person. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Cheating is okay, but I draw the line at talking about the cheaters. <laughs> you can't do that. It's like, right. okay, let's, I mean, come on. Right. Yeah, it's just like, you know, there are people who are held to a high enough standard in this industry that, like, we can trust what they have to say. And the day that Phil Galfon comes out and just says, like, eh, it happens. Cheater be cheated, right? Like, get ahead of it or die. Can you imagine? Like, no, he would literally not. never, ever say something like that. Of course not. It's, it's, it's beyond absurd. So, you know, pulling all this back to the to the Bryn thing what's disturbing to me is not that no one act is disturbing to me let's put it that way it's the culmination of all of it right if if what martin is saying is true it's it's the entire scope of how deep this runs how deep inside of gg this runs yeah that the part is the scariest to me is the yeah. fact that the security is completely compromised and able to be accessed by agents potentially like i mean it's a russ scary. hamilton situation right he he's some sort of like part owner agent shareholder something where gg gave him the the keys to the castle and said don't abuse your power and he you know seemingly 
has potentially done this. Yeah. I mean, allegedly though, like we don't know how he got that computer. There's a lot of different ways. Like, yeah, that's fair. You know, if he's broke, it's like, okay, here's my computer. And then I can just have a remote desktop on always right. stuff like that. Um, you can have, you know, OCR, um, what the hell is it? Called? You know what OCR stands for? No. Optic character recognition, something like that. That, that is what screen scraping, scraping. is. It's so fast. You were talking about the other day how it's like very streamlined. Dude, like there are or a there's keyboard OCR for, logger or something. I'm sorry, so you yeah. could have like a key log or yeah, like yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's, so there's a million ways where Gigi's not complicit in this. Yeah, right. Correct. Like he could have just installed a Trojan in Martin's computer. I'm right. sure that they were within proximity at some point, whatever. But the whole the, the the reason why I guess we're tying that together is because what we do know for a fact is that these companies all do have this security measure in place where they can police their op or their uh, customers by being able to remote in, right? And uh. I think you're right, Andre. Like, we shouldn't put such a big emphasis on it because there's absolutely nothing corroborating that right now. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that we yeah, know... Yeah, he, he was saying the GG Poker RNG is is mm -hmm. uh, not right. And then... Right. I mean, that was just his own like, feeling. Yeah. Like, Correct. Yeah. But, but this is the type of... people like, say that all the time. This but. is his current mental state. Uh, yeah. right. as, as well and it's, i'm not saying it's necessarily bad or good it's just like well he's saying so he said that he has receipts basically and i was hoping that those would be shown on doug's podcast by the way doug did a great job interviewing him but i was hoping to see some receipts because these are huge claims and if they are real they should be looked into like seriously but it's hard when you aren't showing any any hard evidence. What can they do? But he says he has it. So yeah. I would like to see that if he does. What I don't want to see happen is Martin get discredited as a witness. Uh, so I hope for his sake that when he says he has their entire Telegram conversation recorded or screenshotted or whatever, that there actually is damning evidence in yeah. there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope like he's not relying on total recall mm -hmm. and maybe misremembering some details here and there because like you know a lot of the stuff that he was talking about is fucking stupid but it's not <laughs> it's not something that i'm gonna do anything more than character judge Bryn over yeah right like it, it's not it it's a lot of non-news psychic and the, yeah it's just know. like all that shit's a complete and utter nonsense. It's entertaining, like, but it's right. not anything condemnable, really. Like, right. It's like, I'm sorry you went through that. That sounds tragic. <laughs> but like, also, this guy's just a sociopath. That's very clear. Yeah. Um, but what I'm much more interested in is gathering information around the, the more specific details that he's speaking to of Bryn's ability to see desktops, of uh, Bryn cutting off people's agency. Uh, I think that that's a really critical one, too. That's, right. That seems like a little bit of... If that's true, it, it seems to me as if, like, if I had that done to me, I feel like, bro, like, you're robbing me. Wait, like, so, so that I'm so understanding this is, this correctly, he, basically, he would have people under him recruiting people, and if they didn't right. bring in enough money by his standards, he would basically just cut them off and no. absorb those people? Peep this, peep this. All right, so you, I'm part of, I am the, the higher up on you, right? Okay. So you bring people, and you are, I'm, you're... I'm your upline, right? Uh -huh. And then, for example, like you don't go to yoga, you're, I'm mad yeah. at you, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I cut, I cut your thing, and like now these people belong to me. So he absorbs yeah. them. Okay. But that, that feels like, like yeah, girl, like you robbing. Yeah, me because right he now. could just do that with anybody and it's just have robbery. everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, like if that's if that's what happens, it's too it much feels power. Dirty. It's like, too much power to have for one person to have. Right, and I think that that in and of itself is condemnable. So like, even if for some god unknown reason, Bryn is found innocent of not scamming Lauren Roberts, of not uh, ghosting, of not hiring Herm to ghost, of not having uh, his horse RTA for his other horses. If he's found innocent of all of that, but guilty of running a Ponzi, that's still fucking insanely condemnable. Yeah. Right? Um, it's basically like if you were um, selling Mary Kay or Tupperware or something and... <laughs> all those and your higher up was just like no all of your tupperware customers are now mine Feels right bad. yeah it's a pyramid scheme basically what it is allegedly allegedly if it's true it's a pyramid scheme well, right it, it's okay I, i'm i'm a little bit uh nihilistic here like i think a lot of capitalism by definition is a pyramid scheme so uh -huh. i'm very careful to call things that because it's just like we're we're putting a very negative tone on it. Yeah. I think the the real problem here is just the fact that I can cut it off. 
right? Normally that just doesn't exist. The system is just, okay, well, the drip goes down yeah, and goes down and goes down. That's fine. The ability to cut it off and just absorb is the problem here. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, a big problem with like have, being the, the agent, of it. right? Like everybody knows what they're kind of signing up yeah. for at that point. You and, know, you're getting a piece and that's fine. Correct. And when you're small, you have to, you have to, you know, give up large equity stakes of, you know, just for acquisition. Yeah. So it's like, okay, from, from a business standpoint, I understand we're giving the consumers a little bit more here, or the agents in this case, a little bit more here, but we're going to get some sort of scale. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like, I don't think Bryn or it, if this is allegedly true, anybody should be able to just be like, you're cut. I'm taking all these right. people. That's as you said, Chin, like literally stealing from people. Yeah. Feels bad. I feel, yeah. I think we need some receipts it, from Martin, and I do agree. Like Martin did have some, some, something in this. Like he did agree to be. I have a question have about this recruiting structure. Is the, is this an official thing, or is it like is there an agreement or anything in writing that lays out this like affiliate structure? Isn't this what happened with Vanessa though? Like Vanessa had a deal with Gigi. Uh -huh. to bring in people and she was getting a, a piece of the rake. This is the same right. stuff. So it's usually outlined somewhere, isn't it? And if so, wouldn't they need to explain that the person above them can absorb their... Yeah, ability? maybe it's in their contract. You, right, you know, so, so if it's in their contract, then it's fine because they agreed to it. But <laughs> I mean, it's not like, yeah, ethically it's, fine. It's so difficult, right? But I just have a hard time believing that that would be something that's outlined. I would, I wouldn't, to be honest. Like, I'm sure with these MLMs, like Tupperware or whatever it is, yeah. handbags, my mom was in all of those. Yeah. And I just didn't drinks. think of anything of it. And now I realize it's all MML, MLM shit, but there's a reason why they're still alive to this day, mm -hmm. right? Like, they're just so profitable and they scale really quick before people can actually do something about it or the governing bodies can actually do something about it. There, there are some other elements to consider here too, right? So like, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm using a hypothetical here, but like, let's say hypothetically Bryn had signed Ali up, mm -hmm. right? And Ali gets banned and they, they seize a million dollars. Um, where does that money go? How much of it does Bryn keep? Right. Right. Because as far as I understand, when the bans occurred, there was very little refunds getting issued out. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty confident that it was like well into the seven figures that was actually banned. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Chrissy B tweeted today that her and Foxen lost 1.5 million in those soft games, quote unquote soft, soft games, yeah. uh, and was only re issued a 15K refund. But like three of the biggest winners were banned. Right. And their accounts were assumed to be seized. Yeah. So like where did this money end up? It doesn't, it doesn't really add up. Um, but the good news is, is that like Gigi is making a hard push to the United States. So I think that like, assuming no wrongdoing on their side, we'll get answers to this. Maybe not directly, mm -hmm. but like indirectly. I think like we'll see some sort of, it's so hard to use the word transparency because like we're never going to see transparency, but I think we'll see at a bare minimum, uh, like some level of this being addressed yeah. As they continue to grow as a company, as they continue to move into other markets. Hopefully. Uh, Does, good. Do we expect any of the other pros to speak? Or the other I mean, G pros to speak? Jason Kuhn was, was brought on to specifically help enforce. Right, but like, they're not PR. Yeah. You know, like he's... I mean, the pros kind of do take on a bit of a PR role. Sure, but Dean Eggs is in that role too. It's like, what could he ever say? Yeah. How in the know is he for this kind of stuff? I imagine not at all. Mm -hmm. He, Bryn was there from the jump. Yeah. In terms of longevity, And Daniel was like the second one they hired. Yeah, but it feels like in terms of longevity, Bryn's been there so much longer. Way, way, way longer. Yeah. Like literally they launched, I think in 17 or 18. And Bryn was the absolute face I don't, immediately. I don't, I mean, I don't know the, the, like, I don't think Daniel does sign up. If I'm Gigi I, I Poker here, not. Yeah. the only thing I can say is like, look, we're regulated by a third-party uh, gaming commission in Malta. Are I, they, though? I think so. I, I don't know that they are. I, I thought they operated in gray markets. Like, they're not like stars. I don't think, anyway. I, I could I be speaking I, off I the cuff. I have no clue. But, like, it, I'm just from their PR standpoint. 
that that's I, I would just be like hey this is how we're regulated um here's another test something like that yeah i, I don't I know think, like at this point we we definitely have to hear some sort of uh statement from gg mm -hmm. but it definitely shouldn't as... come from d negs or you know oh everything's fine or anything right. like that yeah. like right they, they just don't have the scope to know what's going that's on. that's what i mean like yeah, yeah. i i think, I think like I jason think... staying silent makes a lot of sense because uh either he's gonna get fed a press release from somebody higher up or he's just gonna be like not privy to anything yeah and like our expectation of him somehow handling this is no it, it's just not fair right yeah right? like he's a he's a professional poker player yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, he's not a pr man like right. he's not going to spin this right. in some and way, even shape, if he's like in charge of some level of security like we understand that or like help or whatever like jack coon's like playing high rollers like in triton like come on like <laughs> yeah. he's not trying he's busy <laughs> like, he, he's not like analyzing this this upline downline like yeah well, in. they can't even say anything anyways publicly right because companies can't share their information regarding the people that are banned with others right they uh, can that, they that, choose not to yeah, as far that, as i yeah. understand yeah. right but i could be wrong about that too yeah i don't i wouldn't be surprised if they don't tell any other pro like what good does that do to tell the pros like oh this is the real inside scoop you know right, right. No, i mean no, they know they may not know the scoop but they definitely know the list sure they know everybody that's banned for sure, sure. uh i'm i'm we, relatively certain of that do we, so let's let's analyze that chrissy b and fox and thing like do we two two part question do we expect them to get refunds or should they get refunds in these situations better i expect them not to get refunds uh and secondly i guess I think it, it steers the conversation in another direction where it's like, um, again, I haven't, ran, I haven't ran this, but I'm going off of what was basically said on Doug's podcast as well as other things I've seen tweeted and spoken about publicly, but nobody was winning. Nobody was beating the rake. Right, I, I, I saw that. Like, Landon, did, didn't you say that? Something along the lines of like the top 30 people, like we're all still losing. In what regard? In the high rollers. Yeah. Um, in the smaller field one or just yeah. like online on gg yeah so seems to be that there was a brief conversation about it and allegedly most in that field were uh doing something that was call it black magic if you will of like rta or ghost ghosting or multi-accounting or card sharing so like most of the uh people involved in that sort of ring, if you will, weren't really playing the game straight up. Yeah. But, but in terms we're, of we're, just like win rates, we're, who, everyone who was, was losing. Everybody was everyone losing. Everyone was losing except for, the, except for Ollie and Jake, right? Everyone was losing except for like the people that were claimed to using RTA. Yeah. So what do we think about that? Um, are you looking that up? Obviously, it's super fucked, man. Like, <laughs> you know you're basically no, I was, I was, sorry go ahead no like as soon as there's more transparency and there's transparency only in volume right like we see what win rates are you're just killing the entire high stakes scene in let's be honest like where else is high stakes running it's not running anywhere else no it's just private it's private right so if you want to advance on it comes down to again networking rather than just like finding a medium where you can actually like elevate your yourself and your skill levels. It sucks. Like it, as Berkey's been saying, it's the death of online and it's just a matter of time. It starts at, you know, 25, 50, you know, all it takes is, okay, we'll start at 10, 20 now. Okay. We'll start at five ten. As soon as that accessibility of RTA becomes more, um, it just, keeps creeping down and down and down yeah and i mean I, it's, it's worth noting that like ghosting stables is nothing new uh you know we've heard rumblings of people ghosting all the way down to like the 11 dollar buy-in level for you know cents on the dollar literally yeah. it shouldn't even be worth their fucking time but part of that process is well, this is this is the thing burke it's almost part of coaching that's right? what i was about to say yeah. part of that process is you know, basically spoon feeding. It's, it's just like RTA in that regard. If you can spoon feed the answer to a weaker player enough times, eventually he begins to develop a, con a conscientiousness for what the answer truly is. Mm -hmm. And right. now he elevates himself up. Right, which makes you more money. Right. Like, oh, I don't need to ghost you anymore. You're just a normal horse. Like, basically, you're coaching them up by ghosting, which is like almost like in-game coaching. 
and then they win more, you win more, and then eventually, like, you make more money on the stake. Right. That's the concept, at least. Right. So, again, getting back to this whole Brin thing, the, the, the overall scope of this is pretty vast, right? Uh, there's a lot of implications at a lot of levels, both people above him and people below him, all well-recognized names, uh, and they all hinge kind of on this character witness tale from Martin Zumani, who was one of Brin's horses for the better part of two years. Uh, he does say that he has all of the text messages exchanged between him and Bryn saved in some sort of screen log. So uh, I would look for that to start to get leaked at some point, unless there's some legal reason why it's better for him to not mm. and to just hold on yeah. to it. Yeah. But in any event, like this is what I started to say at the beginning of the week. Shoes will drop. The other shoe will drop, right? Yeah. Dominoes. Yeah. I mean, again, the loudest voices that we've heard are people that are ancillary to the biggest kingpins. Yeah. Right. So it's like there are a handful of people that we know are w relatively surrounded by bad actors Yeah. across the board. And they're the ones that are kind of shaking their fists saying like, how naive are you to think that there isn't cheating going on in high stakes poker? How naive are you to think that like you're running a clean operation? Yeah. Like, how stupid of you to even talk about it. It's like, what are we supposed to do? Right. This is coming out and we're not doing anything wrong by letting the public know because just because it's, no knowledge amongst the, the high stakes community that doesn't mean that the general public doesn't know and they're over here rooting for these people and they have no idea that they've gotten to where they are by the cheating the scary part about this Burke is like maybe I would say eight, I texted you this either yesterday or this morning it was like 18 months ago we had a podcast when, we, when it was just you and I and it was like hey RTA we, we know this stuff's going on and people like Dom and we're like, you guys are idiots. It's not that bad. We're like, like you guys don't play high stakes online. Like you just <laughs> like fucking live pros. Like, 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 <laughs> like you know, Dom was fucking banned from GG. Hey yo. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, like, I, I don't. Uh, I doubt he was cheating. I truly think that he's a moral person, and uh, I I highly doubt it. But it's just like, what a crazy claim to to just like, you know, basically say you're not out there competing in this war field. So how on earth could you ever know what's going on? It's like, well, I'm still in the industry. Mm -hmm. People talk. Yeah. Like I'm still very much in the high stakes arena. Like, you know, Bonomo and I were just talking about this this past fall at a WSOP table where it was like, um, man, somebody was at our table where while he was there, we kind of just like couldn't say anything. And then he busted and was like, okay, so like he's <laughs> definitely involved. Started spilling the tea. I, I can't, yeah. I can't remember who it was. It was like, we kind of just like look at each other. It was like, yeah, I didn't really want to say any names while so-and-so was here. But like, now that he's gone, like a hundred percent, this guy, hundred percent that. Um, and you know, again, Bonomo and I have zero interactions over the last few years. We sit at the same table in the 5K or the 10K or whatever it was, and within seconds, it's like, oh, I heard all the exact same eight names that you heard. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, okay, like, that's, that's not by accident. Yeah. You know, the, this, we're in an information age, and uh, none of us are trying to stand on some sort of moral high horse and say, like, oh... I'm so self-righteous that I turn my nose up at these people who are seeking, seeking unsavory edges. It's like, it's not that at all. It's just, you know, some of us have done it fucking cleanly for the better part of two decades and would like to continue doing our job the way that we know how. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be put out of work based off of somebody who is using unscrupulous measures to gain an unfair edge. Like, Am I too stupid to use RTA? Of course not. Like, of course not. It's insane. I, mm -hmm. I mean, in my earlier days, I probably could have helped program RTA. Like, this is what I fucking studied. Yeah. I have a degree in this, but like, I'm just not interested because the same reason why I wouldn't have taken steroids in college to try to make it as a pro baseball player. Like, it's just unethical. And that's my ethics. That's my value system. I'm not trying to push that on to anybody else right but as a society as a whole we have a hard line in the sand of where right and wrong begins it's very gray thereafter yeah for sure and everybody's gonna fall onto the side of wrong in some degree throughout the course of their life yeah but you can't just live over there 
and then throw your hands up and say like everybody who's trying to be on the right side is an idiot yeah i mean it seems like from at least just from reading some of the horrifically bad takes uh from somebody yesterday it seems like they the people who think that way and think it's all cheat or be cheated are either they genuinely believe that everybody thinks that way or they are doing a lot of justification by telling themselves that everybody thinks that way therefore it's okay for them to do it and everyone you know even like ike is saying a lot of you know i think you're ignoring the fact that a lot of people function on the belief that stealing from your friends is not a good idea and it's almost like it just wasn't computing and it's like i i genuinely think that people who think that way just see it as everybody must think this way and it that's not the case well i can speak a little bit to this uh and i'll i'll get into it in a minute but uh i kind of mentioned this earlier when we first broke the cheating story that i think that there's a small subset of the poker community that just takes never-ending pride in being sharp and uh it's much more about the power and clout than it is the actual monetary return in just knowing that you get the best of people over and over and over again mm -hmm. and that they'll never get the best of you so it's mm -hmm. max exploitation right um I think that within that subset of people, there's another subset of people that admire that cutthroat nature, right? Right. They look up to the fact that somebody's willing to f skirt the rules, so to speak, not, not, be, uh, not be emboldened by the, the boundaries of rules mm -hmm. as far as like what will best benefit them moving forward. And they'll do anything in their power to keep rising that's an admirable trait to some people right like they see it as gritty they see it as uh determined they see it as uh, uh kind of a a powerful trait yeah. that ensures success yeah right and that is what it is but it's also very cowardice in the sense that you are now putting your best interest and perhaps the best interest of those closest to you above the greater good. And I as can understand- As long as they provide a benefit to you. Right, right. And I can understand how innately we're selfish creatures and that thought could cross our minds. Mm -hmm. But socially, I think that it's very clear we programmed out of that and it helped us escalate our society along. So it's very critical that we continue to cooperate as we kind of integrate with machines and technology and everything else moving forward. Basically what I'm getting at is that this, these two subsets of, of the community are very EV driven and very transactional. And that's a really goddamn hard way to live life, yeah. right? Life is fucking hard. You are gonna fall, you're gonna get beaten and battered and whether you want it or not, and this is coming from somebody who is very difficult at, when it comes to like receiving help. Whether mm -hmm. you want it or not, at some point in time, somebody's going to extend a helping hand and you can't in good conscience accept that if you're solely trying to take advantage of them. Yeah. Right? So, you know, the thing that we're kind of beating around the bush it, it was, was like Lynn's tirade yesterday on Twitter. And I don't want to spend that much time on this because uh, I don't think it's that newsworthy. I just think that Two things happen. Uh, first and foremost, like, this was just kind of a very capitalistic worldview mm -hmm. where to her, money, power, clout, these types of things are very meaningful at a young age, right? Uh, and, and we kind of instill this into young people where it's like, when you're, when you're young and hungry and motivated, get out there, get all the money, get all the success, get all the power, get all the fame. Mm -hmm. And from there, enjoy the fruits of your labor moving forward as you grow your social circle and, and things of that nature. And, and I want to add one thing, because when I was coming up, this was part of the, like, all the people that were my mentors, but like outside of you, were all like, for you to get there, you have to knock somebody down, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, like, so you're coming for their head. Right. And, and it was kind of that mindset. So, but go ahead, Burke. So what I want to address with the whole Lynn thing is that, you know, personally, we were very close for a long time, and I know very two polarizing sides of, of Lynn. I know her to be incredibly warm, thoughtful, caring, mindful, uh, would 
basically do anything for those that she considers to be within her inner circle, people that she cares deeply for. But then I also know this other side of her that's cold, ruthless, uh, determined, competitive to the utmost degree. And that seems to be the way that she carries herself in business. Mm -hmm. And well, those two things can coexist, but it's really fucking hard to juggle and compartmentalize yeah. whenever you start to see overlap between those two worlds. Yeah. So we're not in corporate America. We're not in a realm where uh, you're playing a positive sum game and you know utilizing every advantage or every edge that you can find to your advantage is not hurting any one individual. Mm -hmm. We're in a zero sum environment where cooperation is key. And any single time that you take an unsavory edge, you are directly harming one or a multitude of individuals who are trying to do it the right way. So, you know, I think like, obviously I don't need to make an argument for, for values or ethics or morals here. Uh, and I don't really need to poke holes in everything that I think is wrong with the tweet storm that she put out. Mm -hmm. I actually think it serves the conversation a lot better to kind of frame why why that mindset exists in such a competitive field yeah. and why it's not necessarily wrong. Yeah. It's unethical, but it's not necessarily wrong. And I think that we see this a lot and we may, honestly, it, I, I might just be too far removed. We may have seen it a lot when I was in my twenties too. It was a lot less sophisticated. We didn't have the tools and the resources and we weren't able to network nearly as well. We didn't just have Discord groups and Telegram groups and the ability to contact people across the world who were doing the same thing. And we also had no vision over this game whatsoever. Yeah, but in Rounders, it was like, well, we're not playing with each other, but we're right, not but playing You're talking about two people versus right. a small field, not scalable to the degree where right. there's this inner circle of 20 or 25 Illuminati, so to speak, <laughs> in poker yeah. that are just like wrangling up eight figures, yeah. seven figures, whatever. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of understand where she's coming from in not a necessarily defensible way, mm -hmm. but in a way that logically makes sense. And at the end of the day, there are a few things that we can consider. Number one, we have no idea the degree at which this is taking place at scale, right? The more that the cheating and the bad actors are at scale, the more that you actually have to reciprocate with being a bad actor yourself, Yeah. right? Number two, there's no way to really protect yourself in this industry other than being transactional. I've told a multitude of stories where I know for a fact I'm giving up EV with nothing to gain. And it's literally just, it's, it's just me as a person. Like it's my worldview, it's my value system, and it's me believing in the greater good and the bigger picture. That doesn't make it right. Yeah. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination saying that I'm correct. I am saying though that I'm where I am because I was that person, mm -hmm. right? Like I've been able to navigate this career path because I'm that person. If I weren't, I would have either flamed out or I would have had to take a hard look in the mirror somewhere along the line, right? Yeah. That's not to say that either side is correct or incorrect. So from somebody who's young, brash, competitive, driven, and looking to maybe make an exit, Mm -hmm. As she kind of stated, like if your goal is to only be in poker for a short period of time and you see it as a launching pad, well, why not just tear through it in any way, shape or form that you can make seven or eight figures and then jump into the next. It's just like why poker, though, like if that was really her only goal, then why not just go make a rug in crypto or go <laughs> sell nudes on OnlyFans? Like there's so many other ways to just like exploit and make and amass tons of money without ruining a game. Well, first, in. I want to be clear like, that I don't think that she's doing these things necessarily. Um, but number she's two... She's advocating for them. She's, she may be advocating for them, or <laughs> she's at least protecting herself through that lens. Uh -huh. But number two, poker is very fucking scalable. Yeah. Creating a network in this industry can lead to a lot of high returns, whereas creating a network in crypto to set up a rug gets you one rug. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, Unless no. you're Steve Aoki. No, they're serial ruggers for sure. Yeah, but like how successful can they possibly be? They for, just come for, up a, a, under a different name. Right, but for like large sums. Yeah. No, for large sums, Seven you have figures. to have some level of credibility or you have to have the ability to get credibility. Don't. <laughs> you don't. I've seen it so many times. There's 16 year olds rugging for seven figures in crypto, popping up with a new name, doing it again. Right, but like, okay, look, look, 
fine. It's but not sustainable. You're saying it's more long term. It's just not sustainable. Over. Like yeah, you just can't yeah, do it, that. It'll it'll end at some point. Maybe yeah. maybe you know it, it could be these people addicted to the power. Like I think we're we're looking at it as if we are you know among the community. But when they let's say someone that's using RTA, right, and then they have that thought process of oh. Well, I can get off of RTA anytime and play with the plebs. And look, I just won a 10K. So mm -hmm. I actually have real skill. You know, like I'm actually doing a service when I'm not using RTA. I know that sounds really weird, uh -huh. but like it's con confirmation that it's like, hey guys, like I'm this good anyway. So like, well, wh what do you guys complain about? I'm Andre's just right. There's a, there's a large right. subset of this community that's young and believes this to be true. Uh, Squid posted publicly on a Discord that... Uh, having RTA is just a privilege, similar to being born in the United States. Not, by the way, not Sam Squid Poker. Um, I don't know this kid's real name. He's a heads Zhuang up. Zhuang Ruan. Yeah. <laughs> Him. Zhuang um, Ruan. But yeah, he basically posted in a public Discord that having RTA is akin to being born in the United States. And when somebody refuted it, he goes, well, are you going to move to China and live in substandard conditions? No, North Korea. Or North Korea, whatever. Because you were born in the United States? So why should I level the playing field and not use RTA, right? And so like, that's the jumping through hoops to rationalize things yeah. that take place <laughs> where it's like he goes to sleep at night believing that he's truly a good poker player. Yeah. And that's fine. Validate yourself that way if you have to. But a lot of this is coming from just general low EQ, yeah. high EQ I mean, if you want to imbalance. extrapolate that out, there's a lot of war criminals who have started wars under the guise that they are um, fighting evil. And right. instead, they're they are the evil. So there's mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, that that type of mindset. I guess it it concerns me because it usually is not constrained just to this small thing of poker. It's sort of the way they live their lives. Right, and that's that's kind of the issue with burning through an industry like this, making a bunch of money, and then jumping into something else. You're almost certain to rinse and repeat because there's especially for the younger generation like your 20s is a time to really feel yourself out and self-discover and if you're spending the majority of your time chasing some monetary goal where you are now rooting your value system in money power and clout yeah rather than empathy goodwill uh you know basically the the things that will help you sleep better at night and listen, I sound like a fucking patsy saying this, right? I sound like somebody who has the wool pulled over his eyes. Uh -huh. Who is like just, <laughs> huh? You sound like me. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. But it, it's, <laughs> you know, it, it it sounds. But I'm not ignorant. Well, I can speak to this sort of um, because in my very early twenties and in my late, t well, my early late teens and very early twenties, I was in an active addiction to alcohol and drugs. And during that time, I, I did not have access to true empathy. And, I, and my entire um, motivation system was wired around being able to continue to be basically keeping myself from being sober. So anything outside of that was just an exterior thing. Feeding myself, taking care of myself properly, all of that falls second to chasing the thing that I need to make me feel okay. So I think in some cases, there is a bit of an addiction to power and money and stuff that could completely cut off somebody's empathy. I mean, that's something that I can understand. And especially being young and seeing that as the only thing giving you value in the world or you know, not really having much of a sense of self outside of how much power and money you can garner. I could definitely see how that can cut you off from seeing the larger implications of your actions. Yeah, I also think that like um, whenever you face strife at a young age, uh, money and power often seem like an escape yeah. or, or the most viable escape route. Yeah. Right? So whatever the case may be, whether it's uh, poverty, abuse, or, you know, just basically anything that we could process as making life very difficult at a young age in adolescence, uh, it becomes very easy to become cold and shut off to the rest of the world. 100%. And just say like, I'm going to get mine and then you'll all understand. Yeah. And then like, tell yourself like, I'll become a good person after mm -hmm. I've, I've accomplished something. 
Right. Like you use your newfound wealth, knowledge, ability, whatever you want to call it, throughout the underhanded ways of receiving it in the first place in order to then use the unethically pro procured funds to now doing good in the world in order to validate your previous right. actions right. of being people, evil. A lot of people think like that. It's, but, yeah. but it's, it's impossible it's to implement. Of, it's one of those where it's like Chamath does this like in business where it's like, if you want to change the world, you better get the money first. Yeah, but it's kind of bullshit because uh, at the end of the day, process matters way, way, way more than goal. So even if you are able to accrue uh, that substantial amount of money, on your own, it's going to feel empty by the time you get there and you're just going to be chasing a carrot on a string forever, right? Because the process that you built in order to derive the wealth was fucked. It was, it was rooted in nothing, right? It was just rooted in greed or escapism or whatever, whatever it was that was uh, driving you towards some arbitrary figure that you wanted to accumulate. Getting the money, getting the bag now is easier than ever. Like right. you can crowdsource everything. Finding money to fund something is is so easy nowadays compared to before. VC mm -hmm. is like one of the biggest commodities that we have available to us as young people. Yeah. Um, so much so that there are companies built around just pitching to VCs. Yeah. Right. right. That are making millions. Yeah. And all they ask for is like equity, you know, yeah. obviously. I mean, that's what the thing Andy Duke is a part of. Uh, is exactly that. It's a firm that basically teaches people how to pitch to VCs and they just, you know, take a cut. Does, uh, does part of that uh, also include adding a million dollar fuel roll tournament that you don't have to uh You know, I don't think that's on? in the, bi that's in, not in in the guidelines. It could you know, be. it's, I think it's not a coincidence that, you know, I assume all these kids are almost like indoctrinated into this sinister, sinister sounds like, but like, I want to say insidious now, but like this system that's so corrupt, right? Like to get them to think that like, uh, and justify that all the actions that they're doing are okay. Yeah. And, you know, you were talking about it, like your integrity and stuff. And a lot of people like the pushback, I think to that Berkey is like, well, you can do that because you're in a place of power already. Like you can take these small cuts because you know, you have a, a mechanism that can produce more money whereas a lot of other people when they're younger when they're not you know they have four five figures to their name they don't have that mechanism yet right like you had to really cut your teeth in your earlier years just to get where you are right now and for them they see oh well i can cut my teeth and just be miserable for 10 years or there's this system that can just make me good instantly and hey guys I, I'm just using this to get good. Like, yeah, I'm getting some money now, but I'm getting, I'm just using it to get good. And then I can go play in these 5K live tournaments, 10K live tournaments and just mm -hmm. win them to show you guys that I'm good enough. There's yeah, also a so little bit of, just real quick, a little bit um, of real quick, just like being a young person who is knowledgeable of all these things before it's been kind of public and understanding that like a lot of the mentality shift of trying to get the money first prior to uh, call it internal ethical beliefs or finding certain ways around believing in like what you do find to be ethically or unethically correct based off of your moral systems. It, I think it just comes from a lapse of understanding the infinite game mindset when it comes to realizing that poker isn't something that's just going to go away. And that like if poker persists, that helps everybody. But if you see poker as something that's going to die, the logical thing of trying to take as much money as you can and then leaving makes a lot of sense, but it's just, you're just coping. Because poker's been around as this long and poker's dying because of these reasons. But if everybody in poker was a good actor following the rules of not cheating, not multi-accounting, not ghosting, call it what you will, some crimes are bigger than others where it comes to ghosting at scale or just ghosting a friend in like a $50 tournament or whatever, right? it ruins the game because the game would persist if everybody followed the rules. So it's kind of like a mass prisoner's dilemma and it's naive to think that everybody's going to think in that same way of like having the ethical beliefs of ghosting is bad, cheating is bad, RTA is bad, multi-counting is bad. But if that were the case, there would be no issues because everybody individually 
is representing a collective that does not cheat. But because there are bad actors, which is always going to be inevitable, there's always going to be reasons and opportunities to be able to take what you can and then go. Yeah, I, I don't think that anyone's naive enough to think that that's all going to go by the wayside. I think it's more so that we have every right to kind of hold these people accountable who are choosing to take the shortcuts and, you know, be very, I don't want to say judgmental necessarily, but be very cautious when doing business with them. Uh, and as far as like, you know, if you knew poker was dying, if, if we knew that it had a three-year shelf life, I don't think that the pro proper approach is to get as much money as you possibly can and then exit. I think the proper approach is to set up for your exit, mm -hmm. right? It's not about what you can accumulate in the remaining portion of the opportunity. It's about leveraging this time to create bigger and better opportunities moving forward. And that, that's the way every industry should be to some degree. Uh, if you are trying to go down with the ship and uh, accumulate as much as you can within the process, you're still just going to find yourself at an end point where you're lost mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit better off than you would have been had you tried to... You still have to figure out what to do after. Right. And there's just no amount of money that you could take to, to get out of it. I think like ultimately what... What ends up being curated from this finite mindset, as, as Landon was kind of putting it, is that you end up with a bunch of Grant Cardones. And for anybody who's unfamiliar, he's like this motivational speaker from the real estate world who's just a fucking snake oil salesman through and through, right? He has a system for everything. He'll get you rich quick. Uh, you know, he has a, a banal platitude for every single aspect of life. And he acts like he lived it, mm -hmm. right? But the truth of the matter is this guy just found a shortcut early and got very wealthy and then leveraged his wealth by trying to say, like, I'm qualified to tell you how to replicate what I've done. And people who don't fail rarely have taken a path of, of you know, high moral value and uh, strife. So it's like, you know, going back to like what Andre said, where uh, these these people who are willing to take shortcuts now are just kind of like, look, I'm going to compromise some ethics and values early while accumulating skill, money, assets, resources. And then later on down the line, I'll work on myself individually mm -hmm. and get better and things of that nature. It's like, yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, and, you know, I can't even really make a very strong argument against it other than it won't work. Yeah. Right? Well, like, I think also if we are relating it sort of back to this endless chase type of situation, um, when you're doing things, and this is from my own experience, when you are doing things that you internally um, feel guilty about but are rationalizing away, those things, they don't go away. And they sort of continue to feed the demon where it's sort of you feel bad and then you continue to do the thing you know, to gain more, let's say, money because it makes you feel better about yourself, but then you're gaining it in an, ex in an unscrupulous way, which makes you feel worse. So then you try and get more to make yourself feel we better. We also can't share it, right? So it's not a shared experience unless you're surrounding yourself with other bad actors. Yeah. And it, it's just like, yeah, like w when you don't have respect for people who do it right, and when you treat people who are on the up and up differently because you think that they're, you think they're the sucker. Mm-hmm. That alters greatly your relationships moving forward. Right, because you don't very... want to be the sucker in your own mind. Right, right. So now it becomes this hierarchy in every single relationship that you're ever in. You can never really be put into a scenario where you feel like you're on evil, e even playing ground because the only realm that you understand is one-upping. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that you can really comprehend is to get before your God. So now all of a sudden, whenever you put people who are quote unquote sharp on a platform at all times, what happens is you're like idolizing a false idol and you're, you're platforming this notion of being exploitative as the only character trait that is worthy of respect. Mm -hmm. And whenever you try to have interpersonal relationships based off of that, you're just absolutely fucked. You'll, you'll never have a deep, well-sustained relationship, right? Because it's always going to be some level of transaction. Yeah. And I mean, genuine people can tell. They can feel that, that sort of transactional nature. I can tell as soon as someone speaks to me, I get a feeling like in my stomach that's just like, 
there's something off here. I can't name it. But then later on, I find out that that is the case with that person. And I'm glad I stayed away. But there, but it's it's not like you can just pretend that you're, you know, a great person right. when you are, your motives are completely centered around exploiting people around you. What the biggest fallout is, is it stunts you so much emotionally, right? So like you just have no emotional investment in anything. And then you have to feign emotion in areas that you recognize humans are meant to be emotional. Yeah. So whether that's showing affection towards somebody or whether that's having like some level of intimacy with a significant other, or whether that's even like trying to demonstrate trust or companionship uh, with those that you would like to keep close, it's all faked. And that's very transparent to somebody who, you know, doesn't fake that shit. Yeah. That is genuine, genuinely uh, sincere mm -hmm. in those actions. And I, I worry that, that that's ultimately the biggest loss here is that people who are so concerned about winning the rat race now will ultimately burn every single bridge that they cross as they go through that path. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, it's very easy to just take a, a nihilistic approach and just say, well, there will be more people down the line whenever I'm ready to be a good person. But you just, we, we don't work that way. Like nurture is like a very- like attracts like. You're gonna attract people who are trying to exploit you. And right. it's just, and then it becomes a matter of- You just surround yourself with Yeah, that. it just becomes a matter of, well, can I out cheat them? Which yeah. we saw in specifically said in a tweet last night, it depends if I can out cheat them. Right. And if you're seeing the world that way, you're going to just only attract people who are trying to exploit you. No, you're absolutely right. Interpersonal relationships, like hierarchies for interpersonal relationships is just so fucking toxic. Yeah. Like uh, even uh, both ways. Like you don't want you don't want people like being subordinates either, because if a another person feels like they're a subordinate, there's just so many implications that happens with that. And that's why like... Um, well, yeah, I'm just reiterating everything you guys are saying, but I, I think that's so powerful. Like that, that shit only works. I, I don't even know if it works, but it works in business. I think that's why people hate business so much though, too. The corporate ladder. Yeah, it's the and, corporate ladder. Yeah. That's exactly right. Like, oh, this person is a piece of shit integrity wise, <laughs> yeah. but they're barking orders at me. You right. know? So I hate like, my boss, but I want a promotion. So, correct. Yeah. So there's just that, that strife and conflict there. That's just irreconcilable. Mm -hmm. You just want to fucking kill people. Yeah. Sorry, I was, I was getting a tweet. Oh. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go, yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, I think that no one's like completely clean. Like I've definitely, when I first started playing poker, like early on when I was learning tournaments, like I had backing deals and like part of the coaching was me being ghosted, right? And I, it's like now looking back at it, it's like, well, was it cheating? Was it part of my coaching? Like, and it's like, Okay, like, I don't know where that falls in how bad of an actor I was, but that definitely happened. So it's like, I don't want to sit here, be like super hypocritical, like, oh, like, I'm super perfect. Like, I never done shit. Like, no, like, that was part of it. Like, I didn't think it was cheating at the time. Looking back at it, like, was it cheating? It wasn't ethical, but I don't know. Like, because I saw people like saying like, yeah, I saw ghosting, whatever. I was like, yeah, like, that happened. But I was learning tournaments. That was part of the deal, so to speak. That's it. So this kind of corroborates what Zumani was saying then about Dipthrong being a part of the whole thing and being a ghost. Well, I don't want to say like who it was. I'm just I'm, because I don't want to implicate somebody else. I'm just saying I had a part. I of mean, it. you can not say it all you want, but everybody's <laughs> saying that it's Dipthrong, both on the chat, on Twitter, everything yeah. else. Like, I, I mean, yeah, it, I don't know. I, I don't want to say who, but I'm just saying like I want to say my part of it. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great to to own up to to your side of it. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't, I didn't know anything about this. I don't think that. I don't know. I, I don't know how rampant shit like this goes. Is kind of the the bigger picture when it's all said and done. Um, but you know, like in accordance to Dip, he's been running stables for twenty years something along those lines so it's like i don't know to what degree this is just common practice it sounds like now we have two instances of confirmation of, of that kind of being the case um you know this is this is just like why so, yeah 
sorry Go i'm ahead. just gonna cut in like you know i'm i'm pretty outside of poker to begin with like and i was super lucky um to have been uh introduced to poker by somerville because he was just a random fucking pro player that was like hey i play starcraft uh you wanna you wanna be friends basically and then we started a, a failing starcraft company together um and I, you know i didn't know his integrity or anything like that but i remember i was playing heroes of new earth it's like an, a dota 2 remake or a dota remake or whatever you want to call it and i bumped into of all people fucking havad khan and i was friends with havad khan in like early 2008 2009 around then i said uh you know what do you know about jason somerville um he's like i don't know much about him but a lot of poker players are scum so don't bother thankfully i didn't listen to him <laughs> but um you know that was his um optics of things um to me christian this is shitty like i think i think it was part of me learning tournaments at the time and i was naive it, I was, like that's that's yeah, how you reconciled like, no, no 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 i don't think I think that was part of the deal and I was naive and I was like, well, this is how people learn and this is part of how it works. Looking back at it, I'm like, yeah, not a great decision, not how it's done, but that's it. Like, can't go back. Just like, I also wasn't whatever, for whatever it's worth, it wasn't like high stakes. Like, I'm not trying to be an arbiter or anything here. It's just like, uh, and I'm saying that my optics, because of how I was brought up into the poker scene way different than you guys like you guys i don't know to me are just like a, a core community members um uh and and sometimes i need to be checked a couple of times but it's just like i don't know it's it just it's just a weird feeling i have right now. i think that all of this stuff that's happening now and like once again like big big shout out to fox and for making it public and this has kind of always been privately known not just like the ali and jake situation more so just like the unethical underground of how poker live or online works is being effectively public and seeing that there are active members of the community who are receiving praise for being as great as they are and as talented as they are in a game it's always been known but now like if nothing else from all of this the very least that should cross people's minds that do have some form of past as most do it's very easy to have one you play one hand and you're in a friend's at your house and you ask and you say hey what do you think here and they give you an answer that's ghosting yeah. regardless yeah. of how the scale is like if that happens that's part of the overall definition of someone else playing a hand for you so the best thing that you as an individual can do is move on from that and remember that feeling. Because like, even though it happened in the past, doesn't mean it needs to happen in the present or the future. Yeah. And I think that's the important part that's gonna come, kind of come out of this, as well as like the overarching ramifications for actively having a like stable syndicate of ghosting and scaling an improper yeah. act, so to speak. It's weird, like if you told me it was like ghosting at five dollars for some reason i just wouldn't care right yeah. because it's just a less overall value like shoplifting is different than murder right yeah yeah, yeah like yeah, of course of there's course, just course, different course. levels to the overarching crime right also like just to be clear like this was when i was first learning tournaments like i had a coach for tournaments and this was part of how i learned tournaments we weren't playing average buying like 11 bucks like it's not as if like not that that makes it right i'm just saying this was like early part of my career right. like yeah, uh, like I've heard. Not now. I've like, recently heard stories all the time of people being in stables or smaller stakes, and even though like they're at a final table of some things, they just instantly get ghosted at final tables, and they're like, "Okay, like I want you to play your best, but I'm also going to watch every decision you make." And let's say like you're going to go all in in a spot you probably shouldn't, and the person that's watching you or backing you or doing something like that says, "Oh, like I wouldn't do that there." That's that's ghosting. Yeah. Right. So I honestly just think the most important thing that we can do as a community is hold ourselves accountable but also hold others accountable if you have the evidence to do so. Because there's no way that like all of this stuff that's happening right now isn't going on in the back of people's minds who were effectively part of some form of unethical operation and thinking, 
damn, I don't want to get caught publicly for doing the things I did before. I also want to know... Well, actually, that's not that important. Uh, what I should say is uh, it's also should be very clear that there is a major separation here between uh, the degrees of bad actors. And that's not to say that one is better than the other, but like this whole conversation began with RTAing in 25Ks and now we're landing on ghosting in $11 buy-ins. Now, what you should take away from that as a community is that, you know, online is very unsavory and there are a lot of unfair edges to gain that you just can't really get live. Um, but what this actually means in real time is that we have a big problem, you know, and it starts at the corporate level. Like it starts at, uh, and I thought Lynn actually made a pretty valid point about this, where she was basically saying that it's on the operators to do a better job of policing the environment. And that's absolutely true. That's a big part why we're having these discussions is because we want the operators to do a better job of ensuring a safe gaming environment. But, you know, coming full circle to like what we heard about uh, with, with Bryn today, and as deep as that runs, it, become, it, it starts to become fearful that there's too much overlap between the operators and the bad actors. Where it's like, if he is truly drumming up the majority of their business, and he's able to not only be getting a cut of the rake, but also be putting himself in a situation that's plus EV for himself and his horses anytime that he enters a field. Uh, and he's able to do this at pretty high scale because they're the only real high stakes site that's operating, um, I, I guess, consistently. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what their schedule looks like now, but at least for a long time, that was true. Then we're, we're talking about like, you know, something into the seven or eight figures of ripping EV out of the community's hands. Whereas like when we get down to the nitty gritty of like stables that are operating and you know, this is across the board. There, there are stables far more so outside of America. We don't have enough good poker available to us online. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of people who have come up through these stables through the coaching for profits, uh, through all of these sort of like cooperative journeys and it's impossible to believe that it was ever level. We can be a lot more accepting of that though, because the edge that's garnered there is a lot lower than having individuals in a very small field run RTA at a final table with a third party. Yeah. Um, so I do think it's, it's important to kind of paint the spectrum of everything bad that's going on. But I also think it's important to, uh, you know, kind of just like the ultimate devil's advocate. Just like me just taking one runs on the sword for, for me now, you know? Well, I mean, it's not that. It's, you know, you did it uh, <laughs> to whatever degree. Uh, I guess, you know, whatever. Speak to it as much as you want. Uh, oh, that's it. That's all I'm getting to. blindsided by this, so it's not really an easy conversation for me to navigate. But like... I'm not... I'm not I, it is what it is. Like, yeah, that happened a while ago. Like, it is what it is. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure not, that I'm they're... I'm not like... I don't, I don't think I'm a cheater. I don't think anything like that. Like, it's just like, okay, this is how like part of that learning... How I was learning and that was it yeah I mean I think that like you know from my perspective again it's uh it's that gray area where it's very easy to put self above the greater good and I think that too often this community lends itself to uh preying upon people that are quick to fall victim to that um and you know to some degree Rightfully so, because you're so heavily incentivized to. But to a lesser degree, it's just like, well, where's the line then? You know what I mean? Like, how... I don't know. Like, how do you get to a point of... Uh, let, me, let me ask it to you this way. Did you know that that was wrong when you were doing it? I think that everyone was, that that was part of online poker. Like when I was watching Two Months, Two Million, these guys were like in a, in a group, yeah. like just like playing, like, oh yeah, this is what you should do. Like, it's like- They were effectively that, ghosting in that mm -hmm. show. Yeah, it's yeah. like, 
okay, like this is how it's done. This is how you guys learn. This is how it is. Right. So like, so I didn't view it as like, oh, I'm like such a bad actor, like super cheater. Like, it was well, you know, like, like this is like when I was well, the grand our, scheme of things, you're not, you're not right. Yeah. You're a part of the collective. There's a chasm. Like I, I want to make it very clear that there is a chasm between what that is and RTAing. Like RTAing is just straight up fucking people. Um, and fucking people at scale. Your intent, in my opinion, is to get better at the game. Like, so I do think intent matters, but there. That can be said for. There, uh, yeah, there is also. Here's, here's so I'm still constructing my my argument. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, <clears throat> here's sort of where I I personally from see the way that this goes. At least for the next couple months, if not years depending on how certain people take it is when you're given an option or opportunity or call it the ability to receive help did you think that there was something wrong with it like not regarding what other people did not regarding what like the homies were up to like oh me and the homies yeah like ghosting was normal and like it was okay or relatively okay did you personally think that there was an issue with it when someone said to you when you were at final table, hey, let me help you. No, that's not how it was. It was more like... How do you see it? Not how, how it I was. How I see it now? How you see it, how you saw it then versus how you see it now. I saw it now was similar to like two months, two million. It's like, okay, like we're, we're, we're click, like whatever. Like now it's like, okay, it's wrong. Like, yeah. Okay. Well, that's kind of what I'm getting at is like knowing what you do now, if you do, if you make the same mistake moving forward, that's... I would, in oh, my opinion, that's, that's ridiculous. Different, that's different. But like, what, 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 so what was the structure of it all? Help, help me better understand, like paint the picture of like how this stuff would happen. <laughs> I think that's too much. Like, I, I just want to say like my part in it. Like, I think it's too much. Why? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's difficult for me to weigh in without knowing like a lot of the details. It's, it's tough to, to kind of navigate these conversations um i think that there's a big difference between rationalizing versus like actively seeking edges so it's like you know if it's something where this is being encouraged by somebody that either has financial in investment in you or somebody who is uh looking out for your best interest or whatever the case may be then yeah i mean it's well, pretty the reason easy i don't want to do that it's because like i don't want to bear like i don't want to like, it's just my fault. Like, I don't want to, like... No, I put, get that. ...put on the blame to somebody else. Like, I, it's more like, okay, that's what I did. Like, yeah, like, and I think, I think that's great. You should take responsibility for it. I guess, like, what I'm getting at is, like, I don't know to the degree at which this matters. Right, I think, like... No, it's just... It, it wasn't, like, some, like, insane crime syndicate. It was just, like, bro, like, I'm gonna help you out. Like, this is, this is what you well, should do in this spot. Like, it's, like, I was also, like, paying for this, too. Like, it was, like... Part of like the coaching and, and exchange so it's like it's not as if it was like it's not as if like it was like some sort of like huge operation right so that was it i think this is an example of what we were talking about when we were talking about how the thing with Bryn is a large scale essentially crime syndicate this is an example of like the non-scalable uh like individual type of thing that goes on which is not really uh comparable to the big scandals that are coming out today with the big collusion and rta rings and the chip dumping that's happening on a mass scale um i mean it just sort of shows the the difference between the two yeah like there's a difference between putting faces to names um which is kind of happening now where it seems very witch hunty but there's so many other things and operations going on that don't have a face to them, right? And like, it's not popular, but it's more relatable when you can actively have like hard proof of someone doing things that are on a mass scale, morally and unethical without a shadow of a doubt, and then allowing that to be known to the public. Yeah, I mean, I guess like single one off instances of like, oh, I made a final table or a tournament. Like, what do I do here? I'm not sure. Like, right, I, I guess like the big eight million dollars, like eight plus million, eight or eight plus figures versus 
there just has to be a scale. Well, yeah. the big thing is, is that like it, it matters very little. Like going after Zumani is not the idea here. Going after Chin's not the idea here. Going after the people that are trying to scale this mm -hmm. is the idea, right? It's like putting an end to Bryn, taking it's advantage of however many people that he had on his downline, putting yeah. an end to Dip, who's like just willing to create stables and ghost them to wins. Like right. that's, it's a system. Well, yeah. It's a system between... that creates that, that we need to kill. It's the yeah. difference between going after the corner boy who's selling drugs versus the uh, the, the distributor, top, the, distributor right. the supplier, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to kill the system in order for poker to actually live. You know what that means, though? I don't. It means killing online. Online poker's never, ever, yeah. ever once been safe. Yeah. In like, the history of its existence, it's never once been safe. And there's no way to ever make it perfectly safe. Right. I mean, you could go the lengths of chess, but you're going to lose a lot no, of the... No, I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, just, just GG right now, but, like, what's the RTA like on ACR? What's the a uh, RTA like it's on rampant. Ignition, on WSOP? It's, 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 it's rampant. It's, it's everywhere. Yeah, it it's has rampant. to be everywhere. It's it I know so it's easy. rampant because people who are RTAers for the entire pandemic were playing nosebleeds on WSOP. Yeah. And they're selling that as, like, a real, as a product. Right. You could buy it. Oh, really? Yeah. Wait, what? Well, like, you could... The thing that people use now is now, like, a publicly licensed thing. Oh. Uh, no. Not... Not true. Okay. I mean, yes, to some degree, there are a lot of... Uh, there are a lot of products now that didn't exist then that aren't that far away from RTA. Like, you know, Odin and uh, GTO Wizard. Like, they only have a 20 or 30 second buffer. Sure. So, like, if you're one tabling with time banks and things like that, sure. Right, that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's yeah, yeah, possible. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's possible yeah, yeah, yeah. to use these things as potential tools. Right, but, like, what's, what's likely being used is more sophisticated than that. Sure. Uh, whatever Fedor Cruz's setup was, was likely to be more sophisticated than that. Well, his setup was using two computers, having a script of every spot, and playing a few tables, and being and able to run like the like Windows spots. Explorer. Man, you guys, I didn't know about this whole Fedor Cruz thing until... This week or last week or whatever. What do you mean? You engineered our podcast when we did it last year. Huh? Well, we covered it, yeah. <laughs> we, we covered Fedor? Yeah. Cruz, Fedor not Fedor Cruz, Holtz. Though, it's not Fedor Holtz. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, Andre is out here losing his mind. I was like, I Fedor like Fedor Holtz, Holtz, Holtz so much. Penguins. Fedor Cruz, I don't know a... who that is. No, no, yeah, Fedor Cruz. No, a different guy was using two computers at once. Fedor. And then uh, basically his stream computer was completely fine. And then his other computer, which you couldn't see, had... The dream machine of just every spot. Oh, thank every God. Every spot, like, you could Wait, ever think so of. so is Fedor Holtz okay? Yeah. Yeah, he's good. Oh, thank he's God. Just, he's, I like he's that guy so much. Like, he's all right. He just yeah, he's... invented Odin, which is huh? another thing. But... <laughs> like... Well, Rory Young invented Odin. Oh. Uh, Fedor is just his business partner. I don't, I don't know to what degree. Uh, I mean, I hear people chirping about the, the delay not being long enough all the time, mm -hmm. but I don't know to what degree, if at all, it's being utilized in that capacity. Yeah. Uh, I also don't know what to degree it could be easily hacked. I would assume it's not that tough hmm. uh, to just remove the, the... time limit? Yeah, okay. just remove it. Um, but maybe, maybe the code's protected. Maybe it's impossible for people to get to. I just imagine there are hackers out there that are sharp enough to kind of replicate these types of programs and just strip away the one thing preventing them from using it for cheating yeah, um, yeah. i think long story short like if we wanted like a quote-unquote secure online poker type of en environment that's not possible at least not to have a completely pure online setting unless it was literally in a casino we used we're, we're, in a casino. we're far 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 cry away from anything remotely close to a good environment yeah. like right now we have Tens of millions of dollars, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars wrapped up in a gray market on apps. Yeah. These are like for everything that we're saying bad is happening at scale on regulated sites and non-regulated sites. It's happening a thousand X in your fucking local app game. Yeah. You are getting robbed. Nobody is fucking winning on poker bros. Nobody is fucking winning on PPP ochre. Nobody is winning on <laughs> poker too. Yeah. Like nobody is winning except the fucking agents because they have no means to provide to you a secure environment. Not only do you have to deal with RTA, which is certainly not fucking being policed. You have to deal with collusion rings. You have to deal with card sharing. You have to deal with 
uh, rake like structure. team team play. You have to deal with a rake structure that's unfucking beatable. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of people on these apps right now lighting their fucking money on fire. They would be better off buying play money chips on Zynga and earning nothing in return. It would be less costly. So that's happening at mass scale and is only getting bigger, at least was was only getting bigger as as uh, recent of the pandemic. Yeah. We'll see some drop off now. But, you know, that coupled with the fact that even our most trusted sites aren't exactly bulletproof makes it really fucking impossible to want to pursue online unless you're a dubious actor. Unless you say to yourself, okay, I'm 21. I want to fast track my way to high stakes. I want to be good enough that I can pitch a billionaire on backing me in 25k plus buy-ins so what i'm gonna do is put in 1 million hands utilizing rta start a fucking bankroll for myself network myself live and be the next ollie does crypto solve any of this because if let's say we do have some sort of crypto app that's all in like usdt or usdc i don't give a shit but it's in a stable and what happens if anything like this finds out we can seize funds as a community and distribute it on an open ledger. So, you know, you guys were talking about like, where does the funds go or where do the funds go when, when, you know, GG seizes 1.5 million or whatever. Well, now we will have consensus about where that goes. Surely that's a step in the right direction. The blockchain solves everything. It's, it's <laughs> possible. Um, I know the system has to be yeah. very advanced and stuff, but that's like, the problem is that we're so naive to blockchain technology yeah. right now. Like, you anyway, know, let I, me let me let me wrap up my my little shits before we move on. I just want to like you know, whatever my role was it in all that. Like, I want to apologize to whatever like to the community. Like, if I did something I, at the time, I viewed it as like, um, like whatever. Like, if I'm in my boy's house and he's playing online poker and he's like he's like yo, I'm playing this hand. Like, what would you do here? I'll be like, oh. I'll, I'll probably check like that's how i viewed it at the time and like even though whatever like i don't think it was right I, that's how i viewed it at the time and even like now like if i'm in my boy's house and he asks me sometimes like oh would you check here sometimes i say yeah and i don't like maybe that's fucked up or whatever but like that's how i viewed it and if that's ghosting that's that was wrong of me and sorry and now maybe we can move on yeah i think there's a lot of people at least in the past or for sure it's Hard to not have a skeleton in the closet, so to speak. And the most important thing about all of this is to kind of understand that feeling and move forward with honesty and integrity and not make the same mistakes again. And obviously, like, there's no real police for that kind of stuff. But at the same time, like, I know from a personal standpoint, at the very least, how these things resonate with me and how I want to see my career and my path moving forward. And it doesn't involve any of this sort of stuff. So that's a, that's a claim that I can make, but I don't speak for everybody. So I can't police everything that's going on. And people certainly know th different things in other areas or people doing some unethical things. But the conversation of all this stuff coming out definitely leaves an impact that won't go away in the sense of people having a second thought of, oh, if this ever comes out of me ghosting or cheating or looking up this certain spot for this very specific moment, that'll stay. And sure, some people don't really care about that sort of stuff, but I do. And a lot of the majority of the poker community does. And and I think that's the important part here is not everyone's a bad actor. Okay. Yeah, as far as like crypto potentially solving this and blockchain technology potentially solving this, uh, I was a part of, or at least I was in talks with uh, initially um the fuck is virtue it? what virtue virtue poker yeah i kept wanting to say truth poker <laughs> makes sense uh virtue poker way back in 2017 and in reading their white paper it seemed it seemed good in theory but in practice you know here we are five years later and as far as i understand they really haven't gotten their their site off the ground yet um, but effectively, they would have used the blockchain similar to the way that we uh, confirm the ledger in transferring coins. And basically, that's how they would confirm the legitimacy of hands. I don't see, like, if you look at the crypto space, uh, there's literally scams and rugs going on at all times. If anything, 
crypto would right, that's exacerbate the it. And they have, and even if you want to talk about tracing the blockchain, well, they can go on Tornado and just run their money through there and it's anonymized. So I, I just like don't see how crypto could ever solve anything. Like, it's right. Just I mean, that's, that's kind of the thing. Crypto is- at scale, like, yes, right now it is very crazy. Right. Um, and I think that there's a lot of predators in crypto right now. But uh, we all know that this shit's going to transform everything. Web3 is going to transform. So how do you see it I helping just, anything? How do By I see being it? traceable? What, what traceable? Like, yeah, how do you see it helping? Like, funds being traceable, that there is, like, some sort of retribution. We know that, like, you know, let's say Bryn or some people, some boss gets uh, seized for $2.5 million because, you know, we have consensus amongst the, you know, I don't know, 100 representatives that we've all delegated some sort of shares to. You would have no access to those funds. Huh? Right. You would have no access to those funds. They would it, just keep it in cold storage. They're not just going to keep $2.5 million on anything, your site. It just makes it yeah. easier to get away with stuff. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, like, that, that's true. the thing is... is uh, God... Yeah, that was a big byproduct of, of like why virtue didn't make sense. And what's happening now is a bunch of virtue-like uh, in, um, startups are, are beginning to build and they're all building it around NFTs. So NFTs are like the in-game coin or whatever. Um, but they're all just set up for a rug because like they're constructed yeah. in the exact same way that apps like poker and uh, poker bros and all these other shitty apps are constructed where there's absolutely no secure measures whatsoever. The only thing that you can count on, I guess, to some degree, is that you're not going to get rugged on the site. And I don't even think you can count on that, right? Like that would just be based off the fact you could trust the the developers or that the NFTs hold some sort of value as an insurance policy, right? In reality, like, yeah, you're just, you're investing in some Fugazi startup Ponzi yeah. that, that's definitely going to end Ponzi in a collapse. Ponzi is used as a good word in crypto. I mean, not good, it but is? it's a neutral word because right. you can have Ponzi a good nomics. Ponzi or a bad Ponzi. If it's a good Ponzi, then it's, you know, it can keep going for It means a you longer. can make money and not... Yeah. You, you can make money, money for longer. It's a good you, Ponzi you have until a longer you get out. Money making you get out. Your time horizon is a week instead of a, exactly. a day. Instead of, instead of six hours, yeah. you can make money for potentially a week. That's a good Ponzi. Sure. Yeah. Right. It's all about finding the opportunity where you can Don't get show it. up a year later. Yeah. And and <laughs> it's like, hey, uh, my grandson told me about this this wolf game. What's up with that? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't think uh, I don't think we have any answers anytime soon. I do think that I'm gonna stand firm with what I've been saying for the better part of two years that online poker is a dying star and we're just waiting for it to fizzle out. Like we're seeing the rapid decline, and I hope that I'm wrong because I think that it is a massive upshot for the industry as a whole, if the United States gets regulated and if bigger operators can come in and if competition develops. You know, I don't, I don't see the pre-Black Friday days coming back, but I do think that there is a, a world in which the United States gets coast to coast legalized poker and we see a pretty, uh, pretty good time of prosperity if you're a professional poker player. But all that being said, like... This stuff doesn't help. No, this stuff doesn't help at all. Yeah. And all it does is really expose age-old problems that have never been dealt with, right? Like ghosting's been taking place since 2003. Multi-accounting's been taking place since 2003. The fact that it's 2022 and we don't have a more sophisticated way of dealing with it just kind of demonstrates that no one gives a shit. Operators don't care. Right, they just get rake. Right. right. They just take your fucking rake. And that, that number just keeps going up. Yeah. As the dumb money continually goes down. So... From my perspective, like I just see the online environment as being very uh, apocalyptic. Uh, I don't yeah. know how that changes, but I'm super bullish on on live poker. Like, yes, small scale cheating exists at live poker, um, even maybe to the degree of Possel. But even a guy like Possel, who had a fucking berry patch in front of him where he could literally super use a live game, only made 150k. That's live not... poker is booming, actually. Like, it... there is a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Yeah, well, poker. tournaments in particular are booming. Yeah. And the reason being is that the barrier of entry is relatively low, and the comprehension of the skill gap is also pretty unknown amongst the field, right? You can literally know nothing, or you can know everything, but the just high-variance nature of no-limit hold'em MTTs 
will kick you in the teeth enough where you're not sure of anything. Yeah. And that keeps people coming back for more. You know, it's like buying a lottery ticket where they think they actually have a shot to win. Yeah. Um, Speaking of high variance, I guess. <laughs> I'm sitting in this chair. Uh, yeah. You <laughs> played the 25K heads up today. I did. You lasted in orbit. I, we played like six hands, yeah. An orbit. Okay. Just two hands. Orbit's two hands, man. Damn. It was like four orbits. Okay. So two what orbits. Happened? Yeah. What happened? Two orbits. Yeah. So um, the structure is pretty fast. Uh, 100 big lines each, uh, 20 minute levels, and heads up, no limit. You can play pretty a lot of hands in a short amount of time. And there are some spots uh, when it comes to strategic things where certain hands take certain actions pure from a theoretical sense, and I five bet jammed ace four suited into ace king off, and I lost. And now I'm here. So the trick is to not do it when he has ace. Yes. yes. <laughs> I was trying to figure out the answer there. Yes, that's the trick. But yeah. No, the trick is to find that third spade. I know the flop. I did flop a flush draw. Oh. It was pretty fair. Um, and then it didn't come in, which wasn't fair. <laughs> yeah. Rick but yeah, that's about it. Sorry, buddy. Well, okay. there is some uh, there is some justice in the world. Ali lost his first round. To Jake did. In Daniels. spite of the fact that he won the fucking 10K yesterday. Yeah. Trying to peek at the guy's yeah, hand when uh, he's sitting across it's, from It's you. hard to mm. look. It's, it is yeah. a lot tougher. <laughs> Could uh, you imagine being the photographer? To be like, okay. Right. <laughs> Smile. <laughs> Ima imagine he's just like, smile from the camera, you fucking scumbag. <laughs> You know, all here's his, your trophy. I hope you choke on all it. All his henchmen are, are around him. All implicated, by the way. Just look at that. Photo. It's always the same fucking people. Like, do you think it's part of the contract that you have to be in the winner's photo? <laughs> like, uh, I'll back you, but you got to be there when I ship some shit because I need people to know I'm liked. Right. Just like, come on. Like, what? What the fuck is I'm going on? I'm gonna hire here a bunch of um, male strippers. Like, it sounds like a great if idea. If I have a so if I win, when you can clip you when I win a big tournament, I will hire. I'll have some male strippers on call from like Thunder Down Under or something, and I'll have them all show up in their songs. You are a fan of accents. Love it, and then yeah. we'll all party after. <laughs> Landon needs to be in that thong too. Yeah, Landon will We're be many in there months with the, away, the yeah. moose antlers and banana hammock. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. just for the uh, yeah. Well, All right, I got was, a game to get to. We're going to do we've... Smash or Pass tomorrow with the remaining. Oh, yeah. Remaining I 16, think. Yeah. I don't think we're going to get to that. What do you mean? There is def. There's so much information that's going to spill. No, tomorrow's and... Friday, no, man. We're Feel doing Friday. Smash or Pass. Tomorrow is clearly Smash or Pass <laughs> yeah. Friday with the last 16. I will not have it any other way. The, I'm giving the people I'm sorry, what they I'm want. I'm sorry. I they also want to be here tomorrow. Listen, Andre, you know I have a taser in my purse. You are not <laughs> canceling Smash or Pass. <laughs> Uh, I also won't be here tomorrow, so Melissa will be hosting the show. Therefore, you pretty much have no say. I won't be here either. Oh, wow. I'm going to California because oh, I'm sick. losing custody of... What the fuck? Who's going to be here? I'm, I'm losing custody here. of my, my Benji. Pass on Monday. <laughs> uh, but we got, we got Guapo in the Are back. Thank you, Guapo. We Appreciate could. it. Wait, so it's me? You're not here? Nope. Oh, because you're going to LA, right? Yep. Me, Conrad Melissa. will be back. Wait, Brian, you're going to cook some stuff for Friday? I can cook Where some Where the meat stuff? sweats? Meat you guys sweats. want um, meat sweats? Meat sweats. You guys sweats. want some barbecue? Yeah. Meat sweats. Meat sweats. I'll right. see if I can get a, an in-person guest for you guys tomorrow to fill fill the void as well. Uh, the dirty diaper has been desperate to get on. But is Rigby still in? I don't know. Well, they would have just only if he wears a I mean, dirty hour, diaper. Yeah, he should either be in or let's find out. Let's see if we can find now. out. It's um, been an hour or so. But I know he's in town for the weekend, so perhaps uh, I'll have him come join you. You guys can talk all things Yinzer. Cool. We would love to Ugh. join Smasher Pass. Yeah, it's true. Well, he's well, going to be a part of Smasher yeah. Pass. Hopefully. Wait, did we he advance? Oh, that's right. I don't know. We don't know yet. We'll see. Because he plays now. Oh, okay. It's They're the playing now 4 p.m. Bracket, yeah. Gotcha. yeah. It's Rigby versus, versus Dan, Dan Shack. Fun one. All right, that's going to wrap it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed another episode of the Only Friends podcast. I will be back on Monday. Please enjoy my absence while I'm gone. Thank you guys so much. Tune in same time tomorrow.